So Peter found himself in prison. And he found himself in prison in some ways because the Jewish folks enjoyed the fact that John was put to death. So because John was put to death and the Jewish people were pleased by this, then Herod became emboldened to keep doing that. He became emboldened to keep persecuting. If the Jewish leaders at the time had gone, no, that is too much. No, that is not what we want. Herod probably would have stopped. Because Herod was, let's call him, the puppet king of the Jews. Because at the time, of course, Rome was in charge. Rome is leading Israel. And of the district of the Jews, Herod was king. Herod was sort of a Jew when he needed to be, as it were. A Jew when he needed to be. He needed the support of the Jews to continue in charge. Because if he couldn't keep the Jewish people of his providence in line, then the Roman emperor would have picked a different king for the Jews. So when Herod decided that persecuting Christians would help him in many ways, because first of all, it would help him squash a rebellion. Second of all, it would help him be further in control. Third, it would help him to cement his position. He did so much to the approval of the Jews. So then he intends to do this with more people, including Peter. So he puts Peter in jail in order to persecute him. The plan is to have a trial after Passover and then to put him to death. That's the plan. So they put him in jail. And the scripture says they were put in jail with many guards. Four times four, is that correct, I think? Four times four? I'll say it's four times four. If it's not, I apologize. So four times four. He's guarded with guards. He's got chains on his wrist because we hear later on that these chains fall off. So we have an imprisoned individual who is imprisoned there for motives that are beyond justice. Motives that are beyond This man is a criminal, he's a murderer, he's a conspirator, he's somebody that needs to be in jail, he's somebody that needs to be punished. He's in jail in order to serve the greater good of Herod, in order to serve the greater good of the Jewish ruling council, in order to serve the greater good of the people who are in charge. So here he is, in prison. Most of us have never been imprisoned, though maybe some of us have. But most of us have not. But at the same time, I would argue that most of us are imprisoned by something. And most of our jails are very much invisible to others. Some of us are imprisoned by sadness and depression. We have had so many things happen in our lives, real or imaginary, it doesn't matter. Things that have happened in our lives that have left us cold and depressed. It could be a chemical reaction in your brain. It could be just years and years of abuse. It could be anything, but you're here and now, and it doesn't matter because at this moment, you are imprisoned by depression. And depression truly is a prison. It's a prison in which we are stuck. Many people who have depression, have debilitating depression to the point where they wake up in the morning and they want to move, but they cannot. Some of us are imprisoned by other things, maybe feelings of guilt or shame for things that we've done in the past. Many folks never reach out for Jesus because they feel like they've committed a sin too bad to be forgiven, or they feel like they have committed a shame so great that they should hide themselves from people around them. Some of us are imprisoned by feelings of inferiority, 
by feelings of inferiority. Isn't this kind of how high schools run, or at least how we picture high schools run? We have the bully, and the bully figures out who he can pick on. I can pick on that kid because he has glasses and braces. I can pick on that kid because he is not very smart. I can pick on that kid because he doesn't have enough friends. I can pick on that kid. And so those children become imprisoned by their own feelings of inferiority that have been pounded into them by others. How many of us were told you could do anything? Lots of us. But lots of us were also told, you're not good enough to do that. I know I often think of my, my mom, who when she left her small, cold town of Pennsylvania, was ridiculed by everyone. Do you think you're better than me? Do you think you're better than us because you want something different? Who do you think you are? Shamed by her own family. So many of us have prisons. Some of us are imprisoned by our bodies. Some of us are imprisoned by our bodies as we get older or as maybe we've got a disease or maybe we've got an illness or maybe we've just gotten older and we're dealing with different types of, different types of degenerative diseases. Maybe it's about impossible to get out of our house. And so we're imprisoned there. Many of us are imprisoned by just what we think other people might think. That's the worst kind of prison, I think, in some ways. You're imprisoned because other people might think something bad of you. I can think of many people throughout my career who have told me I cannot come into church because they will think poorly of me. I can remember one person who said they couldn't come in because they thought they were so obese that people wouldn't accept them. I've had people say that they had too many tattoos for people to accept them. I've heard people say that they have too many dads for their children. No one will accept I think that's kind of sad. Not even giving people a chance to reject you, as it were. Imprisoned by a fear of what other people will think. I don't want to try hard in school because then I'll be a nerd. I have to do this or my parents will think less of me. I have to be involved in some kind of sport. And I don't think my parents meant this. But I joined a sport solely because I wanted my dad to be proud. Because my dad was a very good sports, outdoors, all this kind of stuff. And I like to watch TV. And I remember one day in which he said, he was talking to one of his old friends at a mall that he ran into. And he said, oh, so... He started talking about their families and, oh, you have a brother, Mike. Oh, he rides horses. Oh, horses, horses. Oh, oh, your other son is Dave. Oh, he plays hockey and he wrestles and he does others. Oh, 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 oh. and they talk. What about him? Oh, that's my couch potato. End of conversation. He didn't mean anything by that. That was my thing. What else was he going to talk about? I didn't give him anything else to talk about. But that was such a life-changing thing to me that my dad didn't have anything to talk about about me, and my dad might be disappointed in me. And that made me join the wrestling team where I stunk. I did lose a lot of weight, which was good. But other than that, it didn't do me a whole bunch. So how many of us live our whole lives restrained? I can think about uh, ladies, well, females, for so many years. You couldn't be doctors. You had to be nurses. You couldn't be lawyers. You had to be secretaries. You could be a teacher, but not a professor. You could be this, but not that. 
I still very ignorantly say, assume that a doctor is a man. I hate it, but I do. So many of us make decisions based on what other people think we can do. And I'm sure I could go on and on about these things. But these are examples of prisons that all of us are in. Prisons that keep us from living the life God intended. Prisons that keep us from sharing the gospel of Christ. Prisons that stop us from volunteering to help others. Prisons that stop us from reaching out to others. Prisons that stop us from loving each other. Prisons. And Peter's in prison, and he's in jail, and he is told by an angel, he's woken up by an angel, and the angel wakes him up, and the angel tells him to stand up, and the angel tells him to get up, pokes him in the side, says, get up, and the chains fall off his wrist. And then he says, put on your shoes, and he does. Put on your coat. And he does. Follow me. And he does. And Peter is only doing this because he thought he was seeing a vision. He thought he was dreaming. I wonder if Peter would have followed the angel if he thought it was real. What do you think? Now, this is just conjecture. We don't know. It doesn't say, in a second world, Peter knew it was a real and he didn't go. It doesn't say anything like that. But it does say that Peter followed him out of prison, but had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought it was a dream. In my dreams, I am so successful. In my dreams, I am Free of all of these prisons, right? In my dreams, I can do the things that I want to do. In my dreams, I stand up to people who are mean to me. In my dreams, I stand up to those bullies. In my dreams, I become the person I wanted to be. Even some things that are impossible because you can fly and stuff, right? But in your dreams, what you want can be true. In your dreams. So Peter follows this angel. Thinking it's a dream. And he walks past one set of guards. And he walks past the second set of guards. And he walks past into the iron gate. And it opens by itself. And he walks through it. And he walks a block. He walks the length of a street. And there goes the angel. So here Peter is escaping prison. And he has multiple hurdles to overcome. He has multiple places on which he could stop. He is, first of all, well, he's asleep. Second of all, He has chains. Third, there's a gate. Fourth, there's a set of guards. Fifth, there's another set of guards. Sixth, there's a giant iron gate that holds the city shut at night. Sixth, distance. Maybe somebody sees that I'm gone now and starts coming after me. All this time, up until one block, at least a city block, we'll say, Away from the jail, he's overcoming obstacle after obstacle after obstacle. And then Peter says to himself, he says, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people would ha- were hoping would happen. It took Peter six or seven insurmountable, insurmountable accomplishments. That's not the right word. Obstacles, thank you. It took Peter six or seven obstacles that he could never overcome on his own. He can't take these chains off himself. That's the point of the chains. 
He couldn't sneak through eight, sets, eight guards. He couldn't sneak through an iron gate that was designed to keep people out of the city. He couldn't have done all this on his own. And yet it took him every single one of them before he knew that it was real. That it was real. Now some of us might be thinking, well, I would have known when the chains fell off. I would have known when my cell door opens. I would have known at least by the time I just walked by two sets of guards who were designed to keep me in jail. Well, certainly, I would have known, maybe even the moment that angel was there, that I was free of this prison. What's up with Peter? Why did it take him so long? Well, you know, I read a statistic that said it takes 27 compliments to overcome one cut. So one person could say, you are ugly. And 25 people can say, you are beautiful and I love you. And it doesn't mean jack. You still think about that one person who said that you are ugly. I mean, really, think about the past. Think about your past. How many times have people said, you could do it? How many teachers came in your way and said, you know what? You could accomplish everything. You could learn how to do this. You're not stupid. How many people came into your life and have loved you, have wanted to be your friends? How many times have you been able to overcome your physical limitation to do something? How many times have you been able to overcome your physical limitations to help somebody? Maybe with a phone call or time. How many times have you been able to overcome your depression to get out of bed and do something? How many times have you succeeded? And yet, what I remember way more often are the times I have failed, the times I have fallen on my face, the times that people have not liked me, the times that... Things have held me back, the times that folks have been mad at me, the times that I have failed, the times that I've screwed up. Those stick in my mind, and maybe you guys are different. But those stick in my mind far greater. Far greater. And that's why Peter needed so much proof that God was with him. It took more than an angel. It took more than the chains falling off. It took more than the passing, of, passing by two guards. It took more than passing through the gate. It took time. Notice that. Time, distance. All the big things had happened. But when did Peter finally know God was with him? When he had walked a block outside the gate. When he had walked a block outside the gate. That's when he knew Peter was with him. And let's just read the rest of the scripture. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where the people were gathered and praying. And he knocked on the door and a servant named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that she ran back without even opening the door. And explained, Peter is at the door. Peter is at the door. I like to think that that's what my dad did when I signed up for wrestling. My son got off the couch. You are out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said it must be an angel. But Peter kept on knocking. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. They were astonished. What's your prison? Have you ever seen somebody's life completely change? 
When it first starts, what do people say? Oh, it's a phase. Oh, they're just hiding it for a minute. Oh, they'll gain that weight back. Oh, they'll do that. This is just a moment. We can't count on that. That's not true. That's not who they are. The real Peter is going to come through. The real you is going to come through. And then it takes what? Time. It takes time and insistence. Here, they keep insisting, and they don't even believe him. Believe her. And then they keep insisting, and Peter keeps insisting, because he's still knocking at the door. What do they think is at the door? And they go to the door. And they're astonished. And Peter motioned with their hand to them, and the quiet and described how the Lord had brought them out of prison. Tell James and the other brothers and sisters about that, he said. And then he left for another place. In the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. After Herod had made a thorough search for him and did not find him, he cross-examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. ordered that they be executed. You are in the prison you're in because this world does not want you to be who God intended you to be. You are in the prison you are in because this world does not want you to be the person God has intended you to be. You are in the prison you are in because we refuse to be the person God has intended us to be. We are in that prison because we refuse to be who God has wanted us to be. God wants to lead us out of the prisons we are in. Now, we got to remember St. Paul. St. Paul had the thorn in his side. He asked God to get rid of it, and he never got rid of it. You might have depression. You might have a physical disease. You might have an illness that never goes away. But what God is going to do is give you the ability, what God wants you to do, wants to do, is give you the ability to make that no longer a prison. You might still have to battle depression, but it is not keeping you on the couch. You might still have to uh, battle that disease or that illness, but it is not keeping you from witnessing God's glory. You might always have a low self-esteem, but that low self-esteem is not a prison for you. You might have a sin in your life that takes you a long time to get rid of. But what God wants to do is to keep it from being a prison. This, um, you never know what these things do. There you go. This is Winter Youth Retreat. I was at Winter Youth Retreat last week. And I'm going to look at the TV, that way I can see it. We're at Winter Youth Retreat, and I'm the director of Winter Youth Retreat. I want that to sink in. There's a hundred churches in this presbytery, lots of pastors, lots of youth pastors, lots of people, and I am the director of the Winter Youth Retreat. Well, thank you. That's not what I'm... All right. What I meant was that doesn't make any sense. But that is 130 people from our presbytery in a building that only holds 150, and now it disappeared. So that is 130 people in a building that only holds 150, and that's with a whole mess of air mattresses. Uh, 25 people showed up that didn't sign up. Um, My band told me uh, the day before that they weren't coming Friday night. Uh, Let's see. Two different buses got lost. 
Uh, last year when I did this, the day, Friday at 10 o'clock, I was told the speaker was sick and wouldn't come at Winter Youth Retreat, right? And yet, all that happened, and yet, there was 130 kids who loved it, who enjoyed it, who, who learned a ton about Jesus and how to express their own opinions and how to express their voice and how to talk to each other without getting ticked at each other and learned all these things and worshiped the Lord and had a wonderful time and tell me about how they're definitely coming back next year and they're bringing friends and, and all of these things. And you know, it takes something like that to remind us that we don't have to be imprisoned. We don't have to be. And I guess I just wanted to bring that one up because is a knowledge that what you are dealing with is serious, it is real, and it is important. What you are dealing with is hard and it sucks. But what God has for you today is that that prison of depression, that prison of low self-esteem, that prison of abuse, that prison of your physical body, that prison does not have to be. You can be all that God has wanted you to be. You can. Witness Jesus Christ. You can be a part of God's coming kingdom. You can be a person who makes this earth more like God's second earth. You can. And God wants to lead you out of it today. Amen.